I'm excited because we are a hundred and two. Our theme is pressing forward, and our scripture is taken from Philippians 3:13 and 14. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, when I said that I would do the emphasis on the thing, I didn't realize that I was going to be getting up and doing the emphasis on the thing. But we here. So, I'm going to tell y'all this story and I want y'all to follow me. Now, I know y'all, I'm not going to say y'all have heard of but we all know video games exist. <clears throat> now, I got a video game for the Wii, and it's Mario Brothers. Right. So, like, with me. Right. Okay, so, I got the Mario Brothers, and... Spent my money on this game and can't get past level four. And the way the video games work, it'll let you get to one, do you get to two, do you get to three, and then I get to four, and then I keep losing on four, and it gives you like five lives. And then on the fifth boss, I gotta go all the way back to level one. So, I'm a beast on levels one through three. <laughs> But level four, now one time I did get to level five. I thought I was the bomb. I got to level five, but took me back to one, one, two, three, four, five. Now, my best friend has the same game. And I went over to her house to play it with her. And I'm like, she ain't ready because I'm based on one through three. She ain't ready. So I get over there and no lie, she is on like level 68 million. <laughs> and like, I didn't know like, Mario, he get bigger, and his clothes change, and he got a little glitter flowing off on mini run. I'm at a loss. But I was cool with being the beast at one through three. So, I'm talking to her, and I'm like, how in the world? Did you get all the way here? Yeah, I couldn't get past four. So she told me I got stuck on four. And I stayed on it and stayed on it and stayed on it. And then I ended up advancing on to where I'm at now. So what I said when I, this story speaks to me because so many times in our walk with God, we can get complacent with where we're at. And we get stuck in wherever we are, we get stuck, but we comfortable being stuck there because we've mastered it. So I got this level, and anything about these four levels, I'm the one you look for. I can get you one. But you have to put effort and time, because there's a difference between knowing of God and knowing who he really is. And pressing forward is something you have to do. Like, I feel in my life, in our church's lives, in, in all of our individual lives, God is trying to do something, but we have to press forward to the next level. We cannot be complacent with where we are. Yeah, it's comfortable, but if I'm here and I'm comfortable, and God is over here doing something completely new, then what am I doing? My comfortableness is not making me move any further. I'm not getting closer to God. And we, everybody should strive to be closer to God. And in your comfortableness, you can feel, yeah, I know him, but if he's doing something different and you didn't got comfortable where you at, you don't know him as well as you think you do. And we as a church, we have to press forward because if we stay where we are, if we are 102 now, 
if we want to see another 102, we got to move forward. We can't stay doing the same thing. God is trying to move. God is not a trying to thing. God is moving. And if you are not trying to move with God, then you will be left behind. It's not a if and or if you will be left behind. So, what I say, so saying all that is I'm saying, press it forward. We have to. It's not a, it's not a, okay, we'll try. But we'll try and see if it's a, we are going to. There is no more, and it's like, get right and get left. Because, I don't want to be nowhere where God ain't. And that's just where I'm coming from. That's my emphasis. That's when we, when we as Joyful Noise, decided on this thing, that's where my heart was. We have to move forward. There is no more lacking. There is no more. And I, I, that's not to say that because the old, the old way works, stick with it, but there are new ways of doing things. And don't fear what you don't know until you try. So that is my emphasis on the thing. And I thank you for listening to me. Let's give that young man a hand.
own way hard. And you can testify that he's excellent. His name is worthy to be praised in all the earth. You just know that he has
And I'm talking to anybody. You got to know who you are. You have the right to exist on top. You have the apple of God's eye. You can look and encourage your own. I told you I suffer from spiritual Tourette's. I'm known to have spiritual outbursts. We're going to be quick. We're, we're, we're going to be quick today. God is good. Let's give this combined choir a hand. We're going to be quick. Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 14. Why? Huh? You know we've been in uh, did the 9.30 service this morning. We got the 11 o'clock and then we had our celebration at 4 o'clock. And so I, I, I want to get you out good and early so you don't have any excuse not to come back. But I would have came back, but you know, Pastor Hill me too long. No, 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 not going to have an excuse today. Amen. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 14, we're going to read verse number 1 down to verse number 7. We'll give you a good Sunday school lesson and we'll, we'll go on. It says, let's read together. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. under a pomegranate tree which is in my pond. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ai the son of Ata, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phineas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozaz, and the name of the other Sina. The forefront of the one was situated northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. There is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the visitation of your spirit. We thank you for your word, God. And we pray that your word will come with power, that it will bring conviction, that it will change our lives, God. That it will transform that that needs to be transformed. God, that it will heal that that needs to be healed, but more importantly, that it will save those that need to be saved. We simply ask that you would have thine own way. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is good, and we thank you for another day that we've never seen. We thank God and honor, Amen, all of our, our uh, associate preachers, Amen, Reverend. To Patrick, Reverend Wilson, Reverend Reed, Reverend Thompson, and her absence to uh, all of the deacons, all of our trustees, all of our uh, sainted mothers, just to each one that is in our midst, from the tallest to the shortest. I know that includes everybody. And to our own First Lady who just showed out this morning. Yeah. And, uh, if you were not here this morning, you, you missed a treat. Uh, we may have to sell those DVDs for something like $50, I don't know. Amen. Uh, 
plus tax. <laughs> Amen. We thank God uh, for her as well. I want to draw your attention to these passages of scripture for about the next 15 to 20 minutes. And the Lord says the same to me, uh, shall go home. The primary character in the text is a young man by the name of Jonathan. We have to know that Jonathan is the son of the king. Saul is the king and Saul uh, was the people's choice uh, because you have to understand that Israel did not have a king. Every time they needed something, they didn't have to go to a man. They had a hotline to God. And God, amen, would move for them and deliver them. But they, like many of us, uh, got tired of being under uh, the authority of God and they began to look at the surroundings around them and they began to say stuff like, well, we want a king because everybody else has a king. When we look at the Egyptians, when we look at the Philistines, when we look at all of these other nations, we want to be like them. What a tragedy for the people of God to want to look at others who are not as successful as what you are and say that you want to be like them. That's what happened to the children of Israel. And watch this. God is so loving until sometimes, amen, God will turn you over to your own foolishness. I mean, did you hear what I'm saying? See, because God is not going to make you do anything. He's not going to eat and put a gun to your head, tie your hands behind your back, and make you serve him. He said, okay, y'all want a king? Okay, I'm going to give you what you want. And so they looked, they looked, they didn't even have a good process on choosing a king. They looked and they got what they thought looked the best. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They, 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 they looked and said, who, who, who could represent us well? Who looks the best? Who is the most articulate? Who's the tallest? Who's the finest? Lord, how mercy. That sounds like how many of us pick our spouses. Did you hear what I'm saying? Amen. Not checking anything for character, not looking at what's on the inside, merely infatuated with what's on the outside. That's what Israel did. They said, give us a king. And so they picked this man by the name of Saul. Now look, and just looking at Saul, Saul did have it going on. He, he, he looked the part. He looked like a king. He looked like he was somebody. But I'm here to tell you that they taught me that beauty is skin deep, but ugly can go clean to the bone. And what Saul does, watch this, what Saul does is he does all right at first. Mm-hmm. Well, you know how it is since I'm here. Just give me a few minutes. You know how it is when you are dating somebody. Most of you have dated somebody, haven't you? You know how it is when you are dating somebody. Oh, brother man is pulling out the chair. He's buying you roses. He's sending you texts in the midnight hour saying, I just woke up and it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I woke up with you on my mind. Uh, XO, XO, XO. Y'all ain't talking to me. See, People put their best foot forward in the beginning, and then after a while, as time goes on, then you begin to see who they really are. And just like that, that's how Saul was. At first, he was doing well, but then all of a sudden, God told him to kill out this certain nation. He said, kill everything, kill everything. And he gets down there, and he gets to look at that stuff, and he sees some stuff that he likes, and some stuff that he wants. Lord, how mercy is that just like us. God told us to do one thing, but then we want to do our own thing. I'm not talking to anybody. I know you won't admit it, but I've been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. There are some things, matter of fact, if I just tell the truth and nothing but the truth, most of the crazy stuff that I got in, if I just tell the truth, I got my own self in that stuff. It was it was me that made the crazy decisions, trying to have it your way. Mm-hmm. 
And so he did not do what God said. And then God sent the preacher down. And the preacher said, uh, Saul, did you do what God said? He said, yeah, you know, preach. You know, just, just like people do today. He said, yeah, preach. You know, if I know the man, preach. You know, man, he cool like that. I did everything he told me to do, preaching. And the preacher said, for real? Yeah, yeah preacher. He said, well, what is this? I hear sheep in the background. He said, well, what had happened was, let me explain what had happened was see I did everything that God said except for you know I, I, I kept the best stuff and I didn't keep it for myself preach I'm going to give it back to God and see that's how sometimes we do instead of doing what God said we want to deviate and do it our own way but then we want God to bless us let me tell you God doesn't bless your mess if God said do it his way you got to do it God's way or it's not going to work at all. Okay, you still ain't feeling me. See, Burger King came out with a slogan years ago that said, have it your way. And we brought that same mentality in the house of God. We can dress our own way. We can say what we want to say. We can do what we want to do and think that it's all right with God. But I came back here to tell you that when you are under the Lordship of Christ, you can't do what you want to do. You can't go where you want to go. You can't even say what you want to say. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Yes, well, well, wait a minute, brother preacher. When people do me wrong, do you mean I can't cuss in the house? No, you don't see Jesus cussing nobody out. Now let me just give you this the disclaimer. Uh -huh. Because it is not that you're not going to feel like it, but when you got the Lord down on the inside and the situation comes up, you'll go to say something and the Lord will say, shut your big mouth. You'll be sitting there looking your money. The best gift that you can give God, you really want to please God. It's real simple. One word pleases God. That's obedience. If you just say, I'm going to obey God, whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. That's what pleases God. He said, uh, it's, 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 it's better to obey God than it is to sacrifice. So this is this all in the text. And let me hurry up through here because in verse number one, when we see him, we see Saul, then the first point I want to make everybody say Saul in activity. They are in a wartime situation and Saul is chilling under a tree. <laughs> Saul is sitting there, he's the leader, but he's not doing anything. And, and the reason that that caught my attention is because we are celebrating 102 years of service in the kingdom of God. And I might have prayed that even in serving God for that long that there are a lot of people that carry the title Christian, mm -hmm, but they are sitting around and they are doing absolutely nothing. I've got a question and I want you to touch your neighbor on this. If you didn't want to touch him, you shouldn't have sat down. Touch your neighbor and ask him this very profound theological question. 
to and say, neighbor, are you committed? Or are you just involved? See, there's a difference between being committed and there's a difference between being involved. The problem is we got a lot of people who are involved, but not a lot of people who are committed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, I meet a lot of involved people in the community because when I'm away from the church and I invite people to the church, I have met more First Baptist members in the streets than I ever see in the house of God. They say, well, Red, you know, uh, uh, what church do you go to as First Baptist? Oh, that's my church. I'm a member there for real. I've been here two and a half years and I haven't seen you and you be a member. Listen, we don't need members. Let me tell you something. I don't worry about who's on the church roll. I worry about who I see every Sunday. Because I've got some visitors that I ain't going to call I thank God for. I've got some people who have never walked down the aisle, who have never, amen, shook my hand and said, I want to put my membership here. But they're here every Sunday. I would rather have more visitors like that than more members that are going to sit at home and do Y'all ain't talking back to me. See, God is not looking for people just to be involved. Being involved means you can show up when you want to. Amen. Some days you're here, some days you, you can't be dependent on. Don't nobody know where you are. But when you are committed to God, it doesn't matter. Come hell or high water, I've got to do the assignment that God has given me. Yes, yes. Are you committed or are you just involved? Well, I came back here and tell somebody that I believe that to get where we're getting ready to go, we need a few more people that's going to say, Pastor, I'm going to get committed. I'm going to commit to what I'm doing. Listen, it does us no good if you're going to be an usher and we only see you every six weeks. We need some people who are going to be committed to what they are going to do. Am I talking to anybody? I don't care, amen, if you can sing like Yolanda Adams and you can play like Fred Hammond if you've got all of that ability but we cannot depend on you when you are not profitable for the ministry. Oh, but give me some of those mothers of old that couldn't sing a song in the right key, didn't know anything about a key, and they could march up there and they could grab with their old scratchy voice one of those old songs that would say walk with me, Lord, walk with me and the power of God would fall into place because God anoints a man those that are committed to him. You can't be anointed and not be committed. God can't trust you. But I'm here to tell God you can trust me, God. Whatever you give me, I'm going to commit to it. I may not be the best at it, but listen, if God called me to it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I believe that God blesses faithfulness. And if you will be faithful to God, God will turn some things around for you. If you will be faithful to God, God will fix some things for your God. Just got a tweet from heaven. Sometimes the reason our finances are so jacked up is because we're involved in giving but we're not committed to it. If you will give that what belongs to him, then why should God bless you with what you want? Y'all ain't talking back to me. See, we need people who are going to be committed to praying for the ministry. People who are going to be committed to telling somebody that Jesus yet saved somebody that can be committed. Is there anybody here that's going to be committed from this day forward? That's what I love about God. He's not worried about what you did yesterday. Yesterday is gone. If you were unfaithful yesterday, if you were not faithful and committed yesterday, that's cool. Yesterday is over. Today is a new day. And I beg you to just tell God, God, I'm going to do no better. I'm going to do no better. I am going to be a man capable of doing what you call me to do. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be committed to God. And so the Bible, oh God, I ain't praying to go there yet. So the Bible said that Saul is sitting here and he's not active at all. He's sleeping in a dangerous time. And I came out here to tell you that this church will not be here 102 years from today because Jesus is coming back and the saints of God will be caught up and we'll be out of here. But watch this. People that are not committed to him ain't going. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're not committed down here, you're not going up and yonder. Oh, but I came out here to tell you that you can make up your mind that today is a new day and I'm getting ready to commit. 
submit my whole life to God and God I'm going to give you what you're calling for so they were sitting here and he was inactive watch this most Christians are busy but they are busy doing nothing yes I've never met so many busy people in all of my day but we're busy but what are you busy doing we're busy watching television Lord did I say that we're busy doing our own thing we are busy but at the end of the day somebody said only what you do for Christ is going to count in the end you better make sure that you put some God on your schedule because you don't want 24 hours to go by and you've done nothing for him uh -uh, you better put some prayer on the schedule you better put some reading on the schedule you need to put some telling somebody about Jesus on the schedule because I don't want to be busy and busy doing nothing so I'm, I'm, I'm done with that I'm done watch it so you see Saul's in activity, watch this, and I'm almost finished. Uh, verse number six, everybody say, God's, God's math. Yeah, God's math. I want to tell you about God's math. Oh, I'm going to admit this. I hated math. I didn't like geometry and trigonometry and algebra and all that stuff. It just, uh, you know, uh, and, and let, me, let me tell you, I, I, had, I was logical in my approach to mathematics. I just could not figure out where I was going to use uh, algebra. You know, A plus B divided by C. That stuff, you know. I'm like, listen, I told, I told the teacher as the teacher was trying to explain. I said, let me share something, brother teacher. Uh, the only thing that I really need to do is to know how to count my money. You know, like, <laughs> back to me, you know. I, I didn't care for math, but I loved economics because I understood the rule of supply and demand. And I said, that, yeah, I could, I could get with that, but I told him all I need to do is know how to count my money and, and, and understand return on investments. And that, oh yeah, I, I'm down with that. Uh -huh, but that other stuff just didn't make sense. When I began to look at the text, we see God's math. Notice what Jonathan says to the young man that was rolling with him. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. And this is God's math. It, uh, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. See, some of us don't understand God's mathematics and we think that you have to have a whole bunch of people on your team to get the job done. But I came by here to tell you that God's math does not work like your math. And how many know that if you are a two and then there are a hundred people in front of you, that in, in natural math, that makes you a minority. Y'all do agree with that, don't you? But I'm here to tell you that if there's just two and as long as one of them is God, then, amen, you are not in the minority, you are in the majority. And although there were only two of them, Jonathan looks at his young fella, he says, listen, boy, amen, who knows, God, if God works for us, it doesn't matter to God whether he delivers by 5,000 or 5. It doesn't matter to God. God doesn't need a whole bunch to do what he's going to do. All God's needs is a couple of committed people. Y'all ain't talking back to me. All God needs is a couple of committed people because sometimes I've found that even in the kingdom of God and in 102 years, don't you know that there were people that walked off from the church in 102 years and said that if I leave the church they have to close the doors because I'm the biggest giver and I'm this and I'm that. But watch what happened. The church kept on rolling because one thing that you got to understand about the church is the church is not my church and neither is the church your church. But he says in the book of Matthew somewhere around chapter 16 or 18 that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Did you hear what I'm saying? So I'm here to tell you now if I leave the church and keep on rolling if you leave, guess what? The church will keep on rolling. If you stop paying your tithes, guess what? The church will keep on rolling because it's God's house. And one thing that I love about God is God ain't like you. He's always going to take care of
here in his house. You know how we do, culture. Some of us, amen, will have a party coming up or we'll have a birthday something coming up and we'll spend our rent money and we'll spend our lip store money, amen, for a one day event and then wonder how we're going to take care of stuff after the event is over. God don't do that foolishness. God will always take care of his house. And even if you leave, Lord, how mercy, this ain't in the notes, but even if you leave, amen, oh God, just got another tweet. Even if you leave, you can leave and God will send two or three in to replace you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How do you know, brother pastor, this ain't my first rodeo. I've been here before. Do you hear what I'm saying? I've had people to leave the church before. Church, the first lady and I found it, preached it out. It was nobody but uh, our three little children and one church mother. And the church would get so big, and then all of a sudden you would have people to leave. And, and let me tell you, I used to get depressed. I'm just going, I used to get, because you love people, I used to get depressed. But then one day, Scott tapped me on the shoulder and said, Boy, Scott, what are you depressed for? Well, God, you know, they left the church. Y'all ain't talking to me. And, and, and you know, I don't know if I was crying before. They left or I was crying at how they left because most of the time the ones that left were the ones that you had just paid their rent. You had just paid their cargo. You had just been to the jail to see about their children and then after you did what you could do, then all of a sudden they fell led. So yeah, I used to get depressed, but God taught me something. God said, Why are you tripping? They ain't hurt you, they ain't dogging you, they dogging me. And this ain't your church, it's my church. Once I got that, amen, I was cool with it. And I watched people leave, but every time people left, God always sent other people in. They would leave by twos, and then he sent four. Y'all ain't talking to me. All I'm trying to tell you is God's man does not work like your man. So sometimes the thing that you're trying to hold on to, he's trying to get you to give it up. And what you can see if you let it go, what he has for you is better than what you have. Yes, man, they like your man. Y'all still don't believe me. Look at Jonathan and this young lad. They are facing a great army. It's only two of them. But Jonathan said, it doesn't matter to God. He don't need a whole lot. Just use the little you got. Y'all ain't saying nothing. So somebody feels like you can't do things in the kingdom because you ain't got much. You better take what God has given you. Take your old scratchy voice. Take your old tired legs. Get them to us support. You better use what you got and then watch God work it. Is there anybody here that knows that his man is not like your man? Y'all still ain't telling me. Let me get my testimony. Make a $6.30 an hour with a car payment and the house payment. Uh-huh. One baby and a baby on the way. Didn't have enough money to pay the bills. But I kept on tithing and kept on, amen, giving and offering. Y'all get quiet on me. And watch what happened. I went back to school. I didn't go to school to get an education. I went to school because I had been in the military and they would pay me some money. And so instead of getting a part time job to get some extra money, I said, I'm just going to go to school to get some extra money. Y'all real quiet up in here. But watch this. I didn't budget my checkbook. And that five years never budgeted my checkbook because I knew that there was nothing in there in the first place. Y'all quiet on me. But watch what happened. Then the Lord blessed me. And I got a job with generous moments making three times more, four times what I was making. Did you hear what I said? And it was at that point that I got the job that I did my first budget. Only to realize that I had more going out while I was working the prior job than what I had coming in. And the only time anything ever got turned off was because I forgot to pay the bills. Y'all ain't talking with me. Yeah, it was a couple of times I went in there and didn't have no life, but you got to turn, amen, uh, your lemons in the lemonade. You got to find you a candle, a light a candle. When the wife comes in, baby, the electricity goes, that's cool. Don't worry about it. We just don't have candle out there. All I'm trying to tell you is God's man ain't like your man. And if you do it God's way, it'll work for you every time. You don't need a bunch of people on your side. So what they don't like you on your job? When you go in in there, you go in there to do a job. You're not there for them to like you. But watch this. When you step in, he steps in with you. Because he walks with you and he talks with you. They wanted to find you a long time ago. But God wouldn't let him do it. Because he 
to these two. So the two of them, they sneak out. They sneak out. And Jonathan speaks to his armor bearer. He says, uh, it doesn't matter to God whether he delivers by many or by few. This is, this is the key. This is the key. This is the key. It's right there. It's right there. In, 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 in verse number six. It's right there. He said, let us go over to the, to the garrison. It may be that the Lord will work for us. I haven't given you the title to this sermonic presentation. Grab your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, the Lord is working for us. What he says. He says we're outnumbered. We don't have the resources. But if the law, oh I feel something here this morning, will work for us. Can I preach to myself? We, we don't we don't have the money to do the vision that I see. I told y'all God's math is not like our man. And if the Lord will work for us, then there's nothing that we cannot get accomplished. So I look around and say, but it's not a lot of us. It doesn't have to be. Because when God is on your side, He can step in and make something out of nothing. Uh -huh. He says that if God will work for us, then God can deliver by many or by few. So I've told you about Saul's inactivity. I've told you about God's man. Let me share this last point and I'm out of here. Look at verse number seven. I want to talk, I want to share with you the servant's heart. Say the servant's heart. Right in verse seven. Watch this. Because can you see this little armor bear? He's helping Jonathan carry his stuff. He's a young fella. He's he, he a little fella. And he's talking about gold. Going and just two of them. They left the army of 600 that's sitting there with Saul. And, and, and just two of them, he's talking about going over here and fighting these people that know how to fight, that outnumber him. And so watch his, watch his response. Watch his response. His armor bearer said unto him, Jonathan, do all that is in your heart. Turn thee. This is the part that I like right here. He said, look. I'm with thee according to your heart. Wouldn't it be something if we have the same heart, speaking the same thing, working on the same vision, pushing in the same direction? He said, listen, I don't understand what we get ready to do. I can't see what you say, but what he was saying is, Jonathan, I trust you. Amen, I trust you. And so Jonathan reassured him and he says, listen, he says, I'm not going to be foolish. He said, but if I'm going to, I'm going to please God. And, and if they ask us to come up, then we know that God has gone before us and worked this thing out. And so they're crawling through. Uh, they're caught between uh, two sharp places and two rocks. And when they put their head up, the Philistines see them. And the Philistines said, ah, the, 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 the Jews are crawling out of their holes. And then they messed up. They're taunting them. But they messed up. They said, come on up. He said, uh-oh. It's all like popcorn now. That's the sign that I was waiting for. And I said that to say this. Oh, we're not going to move foolishly. But when we get the word from God, then that's when we know that it's time to move. You can't move too fast. You can't move too slow. But somebody said, but when the Lord gets ready, you got to move. And I came by here to tell you that we're getting ready to move. I believe God is getting ready to do something supernatural. Because it's going to take us coming together. Oh, but watch out. When we come together, the devil is shaking in his boots. Because if one can take a thousand, then two can put ten thousand to flight. When you jump up and you say, have you tried Jesus? I'm going to be on the same court with you and say, he's all right. If you're trying to do your program, I'm going to push you. And then when I'm trying to do my program, you're going to push me. We're going to push each other. Why? Because we're on the same team. A hundred and two years. People have come and gone. People have died and been born. A hundred and 
two of the church is being weak. Hundred and two years been through the civil rights movement. Went for amen walking the track. But the church is being weak. Went through the Great Depression where people didn't have anything. But the church kept on rolling. Yes, went through some tough times. But God still made a way. And all I'm trying to tell you that if God brought us this far, He didn't bring us this far just to leave us. He is going to fix it. Because the Lord he is working it out for us. Touch your neighbor and say He's working it out. Not only for us, but He's working it out for you. When you get home, give Him a thank you. Because He's working some stuff out in your family. He's working some stuff out in your finances. God is working it out. That's why I can't quit now. You go too far. You can't stop now. But you got an amen. Put your arms to the ground and tell the enemy, I'm too close. You know what I'm talking about? I'm a football fan. And then we had in Indianapolis, we had a running back by the name of Edgar James. Down on the one yard line. See, it's something when you're a long way away. You can barely see the end zone. But they got way down to the one yard line. And they handed him the ball three or four times. And what this joker did, it made me mad. Because instead of just pushing forward, he said, going side to side and they would tackle him and he never got in the end zone but I came by first Baptist this morning to tell you I see the end zone and we're on the one yard line we're not going to go side to side but we're getting ready to go forward and I've got a question you know you're not in here that's ready to go forward how do we go forward we go forward in praying. We go forward in loving each other. We go forward in lifting up Jesus. It's no time to turn around now. It's not time to fall apart now. It's time to press your way through. Press your way through the storm and the rain. Press your way through the hurt and the pain. Because when God is on your side, He's a He's able to fix it for you. And I hear the Lord say, I'm on your side. I want to make him that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you ask for me. He's able to cast out devils. He's able to put your family back together. He's able to open up doors. He's able that made the way. They said, uh uh, it's on now. Let me tell you what time it is. It ain't time to turn down. It's time to turn up. Let me clarify that because I don't want to get a young folk the wrong impression. Because in the world they say turn up this. That's what they talk about when they when they drinking, sexing, and partying in the church. What I'm talking about, turn up. You got to turn up your commitment level. You got to turn up your prayer level. You got to turn up getting in this word. Oh, but when you turn that up, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. There's some stuff you've been praying for that God has for you that he hasn't released. Not because he don't have it. He's waiting on you. My son was 14. He was 14 at the time he arrived. He was about 14 and I had in the garage. I had a 1983 red trimmed in black with a white convertible top. Chrysler's van. 
when I told him it was clean, I said, uh, he said, that's my car. I said, okay, you, you, you can have it. That's going to be your car. He's like, well, can I drive? No. I can drive. Not around here, you know. And so watch this. I had the title. I had the car. And it was at the house in the garage. And although I got it for him, and I was his father, and I had it, he didn't have access to it. But I still had it. The reason that I did not give him access to it was because he was not ready for what I already had. Sometimes there are some things that we've prayed for that is sitting in God's garage. He's already done it. But you're not ready. You can't handle what he has for you. So it is not that he hasn't moved. He's waiting on you to get to a level of maturity so he can release to you what he already has prepared for you. And sometimes we say we're waiting on God when God is actually waiting on you. That boy wasn't ready for that. He couldn't drive in here. He couldn't drive when he was 16. Drive when he was 20. <laughs> God tell him, Jeff, he was. <laughs> Barely drive me at 22. <laughs> I would have been irresponsible as a father to release something to him that he was not ready for. And God is not an irresponsible father. He will, he will hold it back and wait on you to get there. And if you never get there, it's your fault and not God. You're about standing here and pray. But I believe God is working some stuff out for us. Oh my God. I believe he's working it out. Lord, whatever you're doing here, this season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. All over the building, just tell me. Lord, whatever you're doing this season, don't do it without me.